Good morning, everyone. Um, today is uh, Isru Chag. It is uh, the day after a holiday, not a holiday that is always uh, front and center uh, in the Orthodox uh, Jewish calendar. Our kids are in school. It's always kind of the message about uh, the DOE busing will not take place. Of course, I'm talking about Columbus Day or the holiday that used to be known as Columbus Day, which some now call Indigenous Persons Day, Italian American Day. There's all sorts of um, connections to it, but very much certainly in the uh, Italian community because of Columbus. And this is, you know, well, we, we, we celebrate Columbus. So today's class is entitled Hello, Jewish Columbus, uh, because of uh, research that just was published over the weekend uh, in Spain. And uh, it's not necessarily something brand new, the idea in terms of Columbus being Jewish, uh, but uh, it uh, certainly took over uh, the, the headlines uh, for those who are interested in this subject over the last couple of days. And being that not only is it post Columbus Day, it's also pre Sukkot, I figured it would be important for me staying true to both rip from the headlines and to talk about Sukkot to create a Columbus Sukkot connection and run with it. Uh, I don't think Columbus necessarily did it, um, but when we get there, we can uh, we, we, we can see how forced it is. In any event, Hello Jewish Columbus, of course, is a play on the uh, Philip Roth uh, book, a collection of stories and story, right? Goodbye, Columbus. Full disclosure, I never read it. Um, but uh, I, I, I uh, that was not on the literature offerings when I was in uh, high school. I followed a lot of it through uh, my kids when they uh, took it uh, in Ramaz. And um, thankfully, he has a great title that was able to be transformed into this title. So here we go. This was the, the Reuters uh, article that appeared um, uh, over the weekend on Sunday. Columbus was a Sephardi Jew from Western Europe, study finds. The 15th century explorer Christopher Columbus was a Sephardi Jew from Western Europe, Spanish scientists said on Saturday after using DNA analysis to tackle a centuries-old mystery. Several countries have argued over the origins and the final barrier of place of the divisive figure who led Spanish-funded expeditions from the 1490s onward, opening the way for the European conquest of the Americas. Many historians have questioned the traditional theory that Columbus came from Genoa, Italy, other theories range from him being a Spanish Jew or a Greek to Basque, Portuguese, or British. To solve the mystery, researchers conducted a 22-year investigation led by forensic expert Miguel Lorente by testing tiny samples of remains buried in Seville Cathedral, long marked by authorities there as the last resting place of Columbus, though there had been rival claims. Uh, actually, if you look into th that, it uh, goes into the article mentions he was, he was, he died, he wanted to be buried in the Americas, and he was, and he was moved around, then he was moved to Cuba, and then he was moved in the 19th century to Spain. Uh, they compared them with those of known relatives and descendants, and the findings were announced in a documentary titled Columbus DNA, The True Origin, on Spain's national broadcaster TV on Saturday. We have DNA from Christopher Columbus, very partial, but sufficient. We have DNA from Hernando Colon, his son, Laurenti said in the program, and both in the Y chromosome male and in the mitochondrial DNA transmitted by the mother of Hernando, there are traits compatible with Jewish origin. So there you have it announced on Spanish TV. Uh, we can put it uh, to rest. Columbus was Jewish. Now, obviously, you know, the, even the, the, the declaration that's made in the last sentence, there are traits compatible with Jewish origin. Uh, you know, there are plenty of people. And if anyone has ever done the 23andMe, even if you're 99% Ashkenazi, you're 1% something else. So um, there's, they, 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 it's not necessarily unheard of for people to have traits compatible with Jewish origin, even if they're not Jewish at all. You know, nowadays we encounter, you know, situations of people thinking they're all Jewish, but they have a different father uh, or, you know, other relatives because there was a, you know, who knows what kind of uh, sideways turns uh, things have taken. You know, it could have been donor sperm. It could be all sorts of different situations. Uh, you know, so so you know we can find we can be very surprised by DNA that could that could tell a very different picture, but it doesn't always give us the definitive picture. And we'll talk a little bit about you know the role of DNA in uh, in halacha and determining Jewish law in a minute. But this idea of Columbus being Jewish, as the the article mentions, and as many of the other articles mention, a lot of the Jewish news pick this up uh, over the last uh, couple of days, is that there's always been this discussion about Columbus being Jewish. You know, I would imagine, like 
uh, I have always, like I have heard in different places in different times, right? The day that Columbus left was Tisha B'Av because that was the day of the expulsion. So if he's being expelled, he had to go on that day because he was Jewish, he had to leave Spain. Uh, some have pointed out that there were uh, uh, the Hebrew letters written in, on some documents. Um, and so there's, there, there's been this idea you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's, you know, from the, the this stereotype that Jews are doing everything and behind everything. And the Jews certainly played a major role in the funding of Columbus's expeditions and the settling of the New World. Um, you know, if we take just, you know, the, the New, New York or we used to be New Amsterdam, when those initial Jews came in, uh, it was under the protection of the Dutch West Indies Company, uh, whose investors forced Peter Stuyvesant to allow Jews in. Stuyvesant didn't want to let Jews in. But you know, the, the, he wasn't in charge. He may have been the governor, but he wasn't uh, in charge because of the um, because of the uh, financial backing of the Dutch West Indies Company. So Jews have been involved in the Columbus story for a long time. And uh, source number two presents uh, you know, some of the other anecdotal evidence, documentary, historical um some of the, the theories that go into Columbus being Jewish, it's written by uh, someone who has a, a blog, the Halacha of the Day, uh, Yosef Biton. Was Christopher Columbus Jewish? There's much evidence indicating the Jewishness of Columbus, such as his signature, less known facts. Okay, here are some less known facts. In his will, Cologne, by which was Columbus's last name, um, the, left 10% of his profits to the poor and the maidens who needed to be married. These gestures are two important precepts in Judaism. Ma'aser Safim, donating 10% of your income to charity. And the mitzvah of tzedakah, as the Shulchan Aruch says, the most meritorious act and the noblest charity is to support young girls who need to get married and do not have sufficient means to do so, what's called hachnasat kala, pointed out in the Code of Jewish Law, Yoridea 249.15. So Columbus's will, act of generosity or fulfillment of halacha, Okay, you know, you be the judge. Two, Columbus had to leave the port of Palos on August 2nd, 1492. That year, August 2nd, was the day of Tisha B'Av, the national day of mourning for the Jewish people. For reasons that cannot be explained otherwise, had his he had his 90 men embarked on August 2nd, but he left the port the next day, Friday, August 3rd, half an hour before the start of Shabbat. Coincidentally, August 3rd was also the last day of the infamous Edict of Expulsion, established Jews to choose between converting or leaving Spain. You know, the timing seems to be, you know, maybe he want, uh, maybe he wanted to leave before the weekend. Maybe he had to go before Shabbos. It had to go before the final order of expulsion or convert come into play. You be the judge. Three, all supporters of Columbus were Jewish or Jewish converts. Funding for the expedition of Columbus did not come, as a legend says, from the money obtained by Queen Isabel when she sold her personal jewelry. Among the Jews who supported Columbus were, for example, the famous Rabbi Don Isaac of Barbanel, one of the wealthiest men in Spain, Rabbi Avram Zacuto, Spain's most famous astronomer at the time, who gave Columbus his astrolabe and his perpetual calendar, both new and essential tools for navigation. Columbus's major donors were Jewish converts, among others, Louis de Santangel and Gabriel Sanchez. You know, keeping Jewish company, he must be Jewish. And four, in his diary of the first trip of 1492, Columbus revealed his incredible master plan. There, Columbus writes that with the prophets from the conquest of new lands, he wants to free Jerusalem and build La Casa Sancta, the Holy House. For Christians, the conquest of Jerusalem was justified in order to liberate the Holy Sepulchre, the most sacred place in the world for Christians. In Christian terms, the expression building a holy house makes no sense. Obviously, as we Jews know, the building of the Holy House in Jerusalem can be nothing else but the Beit HaMikdash, unless it's something else. In any event, you see how you know over the last uh, generations and years and hundreds of years, there's always been this so positions uh, that are basically anecdotal uh, or can be interpreted in different ways uh, to Columbus's identity. Now we have uh, the latest in a series of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, scientific uh, indications with DNA uh, evidence. Rabbi, so, I stuck, did, yes. did Abel leave when they all left or he was still kept in the court? Did who leave? A Barbanel. Did he leave with a Barbanel? Yeah, he, he had to leave. He, he, had he was expelled. He went first. He went to Portugal, and then he had to move on uh, into uh, Italy. And uh, correct, they all went. Uh, Barbanel. They wanted him to stay. He refused to convert. They. There was. Uh, Barbanel is a fascinating figure. You know, being so high up in the Spanish uh, ruling class, yet 
you know, also uh, ignominiously kicked out for being Jewish. So you have those who the DNA evidence is there, anecdotal evidence is there. What about the other side of the coin? So Menachem Wecker, an article in the Jewish News Syndicate, you know, immediately responding uh, to the Spanish uh, uh, declaration. Source number three, the recent DNA evidence regarding Columbus is very interesting and helps to illuminate his biography and the era in which he lived. I would offer one caveat, though. While it indicates that Columbus had Jewish heritage, it does not indicate that Columbus was a professing Jew, said Jonathan Ray, professor of Jewish studies at Georgetown University. According to Ray, who was author of the 2023 book, Jewish Life in Medieval Spain, A New History, there is no proof that Columbus lived a Jewish life, nor even as a crypto-Jew. And the historical record indicates he was Catholic, right? The, the, the Inquisition, like uh, other persecutions of Jews throughout history, kept very meticulous records. Rather, it would seem to indicate that he was a converso, or new Christian, as they are often called, that is a descendant of Iberian Jews who had converted to Christianity under duress during the century leading up to Spain's expulsion of the Jews in 1492, Ray told JNS. Some of these conversos remain steadfast in Judaism, albeit in secret, right? That's the crypto-Jews or Muranos leaving Spain and Portugal to return to Judaism in other lands. Right? Those are the ones who eventually had to get out because you could not remain Jewish uh, in Spain or Portugal at all um, after 1492 and 1497. So you know, Ray is positing, yeah, he could have had Jewish heritage. He could have, his great-grandparents could have been Jewish. Right? One of the things that when we talk about the Spanish Inquisition, um, Spanish Inquisition um, was started way before 1492. We're talking in the 100 years uh, before uh, and, and more, there was a persecution of Jews uh, and then in promoting forced uh, conversion in thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews actually converted to Christianity at this time. Some of them, uh, were they, they were all called conversos because they converted. Some of them, though, remained were Moranos. Most of them did not. Um, and it's kind of, you know, we kind of have... Um, you know, turn to the we've kind of flattened that story in terms of when we tell it briefly. Uh, but a study of the of the period shows that hundreds of thousands of Jews became Christians, uh, and so there's going to be a lot of people with Jewish heritage. And you know, th this is taking place over more than a century. So yes, Columbus is, can be a great 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 grandson of someone who converted to Christianity. According to the records of the time, he's listed as a Catholic. There's no uh, there, there, there's no evidence of him being part of the J crypto Jews, uh, the conversos who remain crypto Jews. That's uh, you know essentially you know the expanded version of, of of this statement because you have to keep the whole period in context, not just look at his 1492. Uh, you know, so Columbus could have been long removed from his Jewish heritage, even though it's still part of his DNA. Or results, an author and former director of the B'nai B'rith Klutznik National Jewish Museum told JNS that the DNA issue that the focuses that focuses on the so-called tomb of Columbus in Seville is fraught with political issues pertaining to national pride. And with it, which country can claim Columbus as its own? Andrew Koss, a historian and senior editor at Mosaic Magazine, wrote, I highly doubt the study proves anything. I don't see how they can be sure they have Columbus's DNA, he wrote, and DNA can't prove someone was Jewish, only shows it's more or less likely. So you have in this article the, the side which it does not, it can't, we, we can't necessarily be so definitive from a scientific perspective. We may want uh, so we may want certain things to be true. We may want Columbus to be Spanish. We may want Columbus to be Italian. We may want Columbus to be Catholic. We may want Columbus to be Jewish. It's all great to want these things and then to go seeking out evidence to support these hypotheses, but it doesn't necessarily prove something. Uh, in addition to which, uh, we, we can understand the rationale in terms of you know people wanting to claim or not claim uh, Columbus. So that's kind of the, dis the discussion in the news. But especially from that last quote that we see in this article, DNA can't prove someone who is Jewish, only show it's more or less likely. And we'll pivot into uh, you know, some Jewish views, but stop for any questions, comments, or reactions. Okay. So what about this idea of DNA and science being able to prove uh, something from a from a halachic perspective, you know, does that does that work? Um, so, you know, science uh, is studying. You know, I think it's um, you know Jonathan Sachs who had the formulation of the 
you know, science is the what or the how, and Judaism is the why. Um, and, you know, the meaning behind the facts. And in, in many ways, um, Judaism encourages uh, reliance on facts and on science. Uh, in other ways, isn't always, uh, that doesn't mean it's something that's necessarily definitive. Um, the Talmud is all sorts of full of medicinal suggestions that fit with the times. Many Jewish medieval scholars were doctors, Maimonides very famously, who has medical suggestions. Uh, at the same time, for the most part, Jewish law doesn't recognize these things as uh, proscriptive things that we still have to follow today. It's all based on their reactions to the scientific phenomenon, the knowledge at the time. Um, certain things um, you know, can, can lead to, you know, trying to, you know, understand uh, maybe things have changed or not changed. And sometimes, you know, Jewish law may not necessarily be fully in consonance with the thinking of the time, but that's what halacha is. Halacha is the path that we walk based on the Torah, based on the laws, based on the tradition. You know, so there was a time that a lot of people were suggesting that the Torah forbids pork because pork, if, if it's not cooked properly or stored properly, leads to lots of diseases. And now that we have refrigeration, uh, the Judaism is outdated, right? This is a reformed view of Judaism. That's why they have what's called reformed Judaism. You know, certain things, though, won't change even as, uh, even as the times change. Uh, medicine and science is not one of them, but uh, there are certain situations that can become, you know, what happens when the science stares you in the face and it seems to go against what Judaism uh, prescribes. So when it comes to blood tests and DNA in particular, because you know, that's sometimes how you can identify someone, you know, it, it, you, you type the blood and if the blood type is B and you have O, then the blood can't be your blood. Uh, you know, but, and we know that especially you know, evidence from an evidentiary perspective, these become ways of proving someone is there or not there or committed a crime or didn't commit a crime, where they left, for example, DNA uh, as, you know, that's the next level. You know, you, on, some, on some level, you can start with fingerprints and then you can go to blood typing and then you can go to DNA evidence. Um, you know, how, you know, in what cases would Judaism accept or in what cases would Judaism uh not accept because it doesn't fit into the criteria that are uh, that, that, that Judaism lay forth. So, um, you know, for you know, one of those questions would be, well, you know, if there's DNA markers for people who are Jewish, does Jewish law recognize them? Some of you may be starting already to think about there was what, what's called the Kohen gene, able to prove that certain uh, genetic marker that was passed down on the um, on the Y chromosome on the male side of things was only. Uh, file, it was found in Kohanim, and those who had them uh, would seem to be descendants going all the way back to Aram. Do we say someone's a Kohen if they have it? Do we say they're not a Kohen if they don't have it? Or what about Judaism? So uh, Rabbi Chaim Jachter uh, presents a number of the views that exist in that, and, and, and really not the, the, the most contemporary. We're not going to start with the most contemporary. Let's go back 100 years to Rabbi Cook. Uh, Rabbi Cook was aware of these developments, and they were not necessarily as uh, developed uh, as they are now. But Rav Cook, source number four, notes that the halacha, that if a doctor determines that a patient will not endanger his life by fasting on Yom Kippur, and the patient disagrees, we permit the patient to eat on Yom Kippur, even though the halacha also permits the patient to eat in the reverse case, where the patient insists he need not eat, and the doctor states that he must eat in order to preserve his life. Rav Cook concludes from these halachot that we regard scientific knowledge as only possibly correct. You must consider both the possibility that the doctor is correct and that he is incorrect. And therefore, in both instances, the patient is instructed to eat on Yom Kippur. So you have, uh, you know, a, a very interesting you know, observation from something that was, you know, very timely that we just uh, encountered. Right. Can you eat on Yom Kippur? Who decides? The doctor, or the patient. On some level, it's both. Doctor says yes. Patient says no. You can rely on the patient. Doctor says no, the patient, you know, the patient says no, the doctor says yes, you can rely on the doctor. You know, it's like the, you know, he's right, he's right, she's right. How can they all be right? You're right, right? It's, uh, you, 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 you Rav, Rav Cook points out, especially in a case that's relevant to medicine and halacha or health and halacha, that we 
you know, we validate and recognize the, the, the expertise of the doctor. Uh, at the same time, that's not always determinative. Sometimes it's determinative, but sometimes it's not. So if Cook goes from there to say that science is sometimes determinative, sometimes not, which means it's never necessarily 100% authoritative in determining Jewish law. That's Rav Cook's approach. Rabbi Jackter continues, not all posts can agree with this approach. Rav Shlomo Duchovsky, a leading contemporary Dayan who sits on the Israeli rabbinate's rabbinic court of appeals, a very well-known halachist and jurist, I get to claim a relative of my wife, notes that the Rambam, and the Tashbates write that many medical assertions that appear in the Gemara are not derived from divine sources, but rather from the medical knowledge of the time. According to this approach, the accepted scientific evidence of the time should constitute admissible evidence in a Beit Din hearing. Rav Dachowski notes that though the Rivash disagrees with the Rambam, and Tashbates argues that the medical assertions that appear in the Gemara are in fact divinely inspired, just like the rest of the Talmud. So, you know, Rav Dichovsky posits that, you know, science of the time should be determinative. It depends on the science of the time. But he also acknowledges that that's a disputed assertion. So you, you have Rav Koch who says science is not determinative because we have a, a, a case in Halacha that proves that. You have Rav Dichovsky saying that, yes, science can be determinative, but that's a disputed uh, position. And so, you know, generally, you know, what happens, you know, if, if you like, you know, so what's the upshot? Generally, what happens in cases where of great pressing need, um, we, you know, the, the, to, to, to make as much use of the scientific evidence as possible would be acceptable. Um, and when cases where the science is not something we're interested in, we wouldn't look at it. So the two cases that immediately come to mind was uh, after 9-11, and DNA evidence was being employed to identify whether people were uh, in the towers when they fell, right? Because according to Jewish law, just because someone works in the towers and it was after the time they're in the towers, or even if they made a phone call from the towers, how do we know they didn't escape, right? The Talmud, on the one hand, wants, you know, we're talking about someone who's married, a husband's in the towers, now the wife is, 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 is you know, likely widowed. How do you prove that from a Jewish law perspective? Right? The Talmud wants to, uh, free, uh, allow the wife to be determined to be a widow so she can remarry, but Jewish law is very strict when it regards to the evidentiary requirements. How do you know that the husband didn't go in there and that same day was the day he planned to run away from his wife and that's what happened and happens to very conveniently the towers fell so they think he's dead, but what does Jewish law say about it? So in these cases, uh, th there was uh, a, a uh, significant effort to use any DNA evidence found as much as possible to help certify and determine that the husband was in fact dead and the wife was unfortunately now a widow, but free to remarry. And there's uh, volumes written, Rabbi Jackter has written articles about it, Rabbi Yona Reese, uh, who was in at the Besden of America, now in Chicago, uh, you know, a number of rabbis were involved, Rabbi Mordechai Willig was very involved in this. The, the literature is there that they tried to use DNA evidence because yes, the science of the times may be accepted as factual. It's not always enough to be absolutely determinative. Um, however, on the flip side of the case, um, you know, even if the, you want to accept that DNA evidence is factual and, and is accurate, uh, in terms of uh, sometimes proving paternity, Judaism is not always so interested in it being determinative. And that's the case of the mamzer, right? The mamzer is if a woman has a child, a married woman has a child from, and the father is not her husband, right? It's not being born out of wedlock. Uh, it's being born from a forbidden illicit relationship between a married woman and another man. And, um, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, let's say you're not sure, you know, should you do a DNA test to prove it one way or the other? The halacha would say absolutely not. We're not interested because th that's not a, a, if you did the DNA test, you may have more difficulty saying no, but halacha is not interested in what DNA has to say in cases where it's not helpful or relevant or even detrimental from a halachic perspective. In the case of a mamzer, the, the Talmud says very forcefully, we don't want to know. There's no, if we, you, you don't have to know, we don't want to know. And that's how, you know, so here you have, even if the science is accurate, the halacha does not want to get involved in applying the science to prove something. Uh, and, you know, in, in many ways, the, this divide between wanting to use it or not wanting to use it does come up with regards to identity as well. So we mentioned before the Kohen gene. 
Whether a person is a Kohen or not these days is not that significant uh, an outcome. It means having certain uh, responsibilities or opportunities uh, uh, in the synagogue, first Aliyah, uh, being called uh, you know, to, to the Torah first or be blessing the congregation. But it doesn't have the same, he's not bringing sacrifices in a temple anymore or eating the first fruits anymore or things of that sort. So we're, we're not necessarily opposed to using that as a, one of the identifying possibilities whether a person is a Kohen or not. Let's say a person's not sure. It's similar to there was a time that if a person's uh, parent or grandparent's uh, gravestone had the Mr. Spock, you know, the, 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 the priestly uh, hand signal, that if that's on the graves like this, that would be a marker that a person is Kohen. But that also, that's not absolutely determinative. It's basically anecdotal. And so, you know, the, the, the Kohen gene is more scientific, but again, this Kohen heritage, how do you know what other marriages took place along the way? The, the, the stakes are not really that significant uh, from, a, from, a, from an absolute halachic perspective. So yes, no, maybe so, you know, it, it can be an indicator um, for a person who thinks they're Kohen and wants to confirm they're Kohen uh, and the like. Um, when it comes to Jewish identity, that's could be more significant. It's more about you know you counting in a minion in the first place, leading the congregation in, in mitzvos uh, and the like. You know, in terms of what kind of uh, marriage ceremony takes place, is it between two Jews and or a Jew and a non-Jew? When the stakes are higher, you know the, the that that last comment that we saw in uh, source number three, right? DNA can't prove someone was Jewish; only show it's more or less likely, more or less likely to be a Kohen is not as significant an outcome of one is uh, Jewish or not Jewish. So halacha may utilize the DNA evidence in the Kohen, but isn't it will not be determinative in the uh, Jewish uh, identity. And so, you know, the, 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 at the end of the day, the you know Jewish relationship with just genetic uh, identification, right? You have, you know, Rav Kook who wavers, you have a Rav Dachowski approach, which recognizes that science is accurate and valid but then it becomes a question whether it's halakhically acceptable sometimes depends on the level of, uh, uh, of importance of how necessary or significant or crucial or critical the DNA evidence would be uh, in a particular case. And so at some level, you know, as we started, was, he, was Columbus Jewish? Well, the DNA evidence isn't necessarily enough. Others is anecdotal. At the end of the day, um, you know, does it uh, really matter? No, but it's an interesting topic of conversation uh, and gives us a chance to talk about some of these other uh, halachic issues. Uh, and before we pivot into the Columbus Sogas connection, I'll stop for any questions, comments, or reactions. There was always talk of one of his crew members being Jewish. Um, is there any other uh, information about that? No, no. I, the, the, the short answer, no. You know, I guess you know the, the whatever is out there is out there, and you know, here in particular, since there's a some sense of being able to identify, you know, where Columbus is buried and to seek DNA evidence and knowing who his son is, it became more, uh, m more possible to e explore that avenue. And you know, being able to claim Columbus is uh, you know a bigger deal than than than, than claiming his first mate. You know, so I guess you know a lot of the other thing. I mean, look, I'm like you said, the re, you know the, the research is out there, uh, and the like. But it's you know, it, put it this way, you know, uh, it, it wouldn't be ripped from the headline just from his first mate. Hi, Rabbi. What about hello? Hi, good morning. What about um, situations where we know for sure that the science that the halacha was based on? What the science of the day was absolutely wrong. I'm thinking about the uh, Gemara and Shabbos. I don't know where it is exactly. I think it's the beginning somewhere where they talk about uh, whether you're allowed to kill lice on Shabbos. And uh, the, the science of the day was that lice were created by spontaneous generation. Right. We know that's not the case. Right. How does that reconcile with this? Uh, so, so on some, you know, so so the the question has to do with what if the you know w w are there areas where Jewish law is affected by the science being absolutely completely different? The science as presented in the Talmud 
as it pertains to certain legal uh, examples, has completely changed. So they call that, it's mentioned a couple of places, including in the Talmud and Shabbos, as Nishtanu Hatvayim. Right? Ha, ha, has, has the science changed or you know, has the physical reality changed? And usually it's more the observation and understanding than the actual physical reality. Uh, there, there are those who are more willing or less willing to uh, accept that. Um, generally, I, one of the explanations that, you know, that, that I have heard that I think it, it works with regards to changing the halacha is that the uh, Rabbi Avram Mishai Karolitz, the Chazan Ish, felt that if it's in the Talmud, um, the uh, if it's in the Talmud, then the halacha is always going to apply, even if the halacha seems to be based on science. The Chazan Ish said that with regards to trefos, the Talmud's uh, classification of animals, of, of injuries to an animal that meant they died within the year. And you know that was their observation, but those the, the, these uh, the, the, these trefos, which again for us is far less relevant because we're not investigating our chicken stomachs or our animal stomachs uh, for kosher anymore. We're relying on a kosher agency. Uh, the, the, it would be that certain cer certain defects would be considered trefos, which would mean the animal would have to die within twelve months. But what if we see animals that have those defects that don't die within twelve months? So you know, so the Chazan you said that just because because the rabbis are connected. The halacha, the halacha with the observable physical phenomenon uh, doesn't mean that the connection is was 100% linked. And so what the halacha, what the Talmud says sets the halacha, but it doesn't necessarily set the science. Okay, thank you. That's, I like that. <laughs> and uh, no, he, he connects it to the famous uh, statement in the Talmud of Odazar that the world will exist for 6,000 years. 2,000 years of creation, 2,000 years of Torah, uh, and, and then 2,000 years of uh, the redemption. And he says, kind of, if you do that calculation, the 2,000 years of Torah end with the Mishnah, essentially. And so the idea of the Torah is developing its legal, um, its uh, precedents that would always be applicable, those uh, were uh, finalized or concretized with the Mishnah or the Talmud, and, 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 and then we move on to living Okay. Thanks. Whoever wants, whoever wants to take the win for you know, whoever, look these days, some people want Columbus. A lot of people don't want Columbus, right? They're tearing down statues of Columbus and the like. So, you know, how, however you want it. The one thing I can say is that no matter what, what you think about it, on Columbus Day this year we did not say Tach, and that's nothing to do with Columbus Day. It just has to do with we are now in a more festive season where we don't say Tach for the rest of the month. Or as I told the daily minion worshippers, they've been coming so regularly during the high holidays, they can take the rest of the month off from saying. The penitential prayer. So let's. What about Columbus and the uh, Sukkot? So Christopher Columbus, Wikipedia, not really the source, uh, you know, of record anymore with everything going on there that's politicizing it. But Christopher Columbus was an Italian explorer. All right, Italy. What does Italy have to do with Sukkot? So when we talk about uh, Sukkot, we have the mitzvah Sukkot. There was a nice class last night about that. But there's also the Arba Minim, the four species, the Lulav, Esrog, Hadassim, and Arabos. And that starts with off of uh, describing the four species in source number six, Vayikra 2340, creates Hadar. You take the fruit of a Hadar tree. Now, who here knows what, when, when you see this, what's the fruit of a Hadar tree? Everyone says it's an Esrog. That's one of the four species. But how do you know that the, the Hadar tree is an Esrog? Right. And, and, and so I would imagine many people think, well, of course, it's an Ezra because we know it's an Ezra. Right. It's, it, but this becomes the subject of a lot of discussion. Ibn Ezra on that verse. They also transmitted to us the tradition that the fruit of the goodly tree, the Hadar tree, refers to the Etro. In truth, there is no fruit of the tree more beautiful than the Etro. The rabbis interpreted the phrase Eitz Hadar to mean a fruit which dwells on the tree. They use the verse as a support for their tradition. So really what Ibn Ezra is suggesting is that we have a tradition. Right, there's certain things the Torah doesn't give all of the information. There's an oral tradition, and this is one of those oral tradition cases where the verse creates Hadar if it describes a beautiful tree or fruit which dwells on the tree for Hadar. The verse supports the tradition that was transmitted to us that the pre-8th Hadar is an Esra. 
So, you know, basically, you know, imagine everyone sitting around the campfire in the Sinai Desert through 2,400 years ago, uh, 3,300 years ago. Oh, yeah, oh, Priyat Sadar, oh, that's an esrog. And then that just carried forward forever and ever and ever. And the verse and the words Priyat Sadar are supportive of that tradition because it happens to also describe the esrog citron fruit. That's the Ibn Ezra. Rambam has something very similar uh, as well. It's tradition. Right, it's the same way that you know certain things that you know when, when the Torah describes the boxes or the signs in our arm and our head, we know that those are to fill in. Ramban, the correct interpretation appears to me that the tree, which is called the Aramaic language Ethrog, is called in the sacred language Hadar. And the meaning of the word Ethrog is desirable. Ramban says it's all linguistic, right? Hadar Esrog, that's what it is. It's linguistic. The Esrog is Hadar. It's the translation. We know why we stuck with the Aramaic. You know, we've gotten very Aramaic. That's, you know, the language of the Jewish nation was Aramaic and Talmud at times, and that's a language that's stuck. All right, so Ibn Ezra, tradition, Ramban, no tradition. The Torah tells us it's Hadar, and Hadar is an Esro. That's the translation, right? It, it, it's like a great, you know, language discussion. Anyway, who came up with the first words? Or how do, you know, it's, it's etymology and the like. So the Rambam says, yeah, you know, they pointed to the Esrog and they said Hadar and other people called it Esrog. And the word Esrog is the one that we now have. And so, you know, this evolution is, is fascinating because there was a book written by David Z. Moster, which was reviewed by Rachel Scheinerman in the Jewish Review of Books, because the Esrog is not native to the Middle East. It's not native to Europe. Right. Source number nine, why the Jews decide that creates Hadar refers to a specific fruit species and then choose of all things the S road. To answer this question, David Z. Moser turns to the history of this lesser known citrus. The S road is indigenous not to the land of Israel, but to China. Several millennia ago, grew, grew most abundantly in Yunnan, a southwestern Chinese province. We're still used to this thing in traditional Chinese medicine. It goes on to point out in the book, in the article mentions that it was used a lot with fertility. Uh, issues. It was very associated with fertility, which may relate to a little known, very strange custom of the woman biting the pitum of the esrog off, the pregnant woman biting the pitum of the esrog off after the holiday, because the esrog fruit uh, seems to have been associated with fertility for thousands of years. Anyway, from there, it traveled to northern India and western across the subcontinent. When Darius I conquered India in 518 BCE, right, this is kind of like the, uh, you know, after the first temple, the fruit spread to Persia. Now it's called Wadrang, which seems to be the linguistic precursor to the Aramaic word etrog. And Wadrang also seems to be a precursor to the English word orange in that citrus family. But why would Jews have decided that when the Torah commanded them to bring the pre eight Hadar in the 15th to 7th month, it meant etrog, a fruit that was unknown land of Israel before the Persians? Moser explains that as Jewish practice became increasingly legalistic and textual, which is to say as the Jews began to look in scripture for more concrete rules about ritual, Texts like Leviticus 23:40 and ambiguous phrases like creates had are suddenly cried out for halachic definition of explanation. Some ancient sources, including the less canonical Aramaic translations of the Bible and a rabbi quoted the Jerusalem Talmud, simply interpreted the phrase as simply fruit from a beautiful tree. But by the end of the Second Temple period, much more specific identification of creates Hadar as etro found in Josephus, Uncleus, and the Mishnah one out. Moser argues that the etrog was chosen as the beautiful fruit precisely because it was exotic, the prize of Ramat Rachel Paradise. Unusual in color and smell and used in medicines and rarely consumed because, well, between the thick rind and copious seeds, there simply wasn't much fruit to be had. The etrog was a good candidate for the role of the beautiful fruit. The etrog was strange in other ways, too. The tree blossoms year-round, is covered in thorns, and perhaps more significantly, it cannot grow without a great deal of irrigation. In a year of inadequate rain, there would be no etrogs. This may have made it both a symbol of water and a talisman thought capable of calling down rain, a powerful tie in the fall harvest festival. So really, when you talk about Ibn Ezra and Ramban, they're incorporating that idea. They're trying to find, to anchor the tradition in the text. Either it's tradition or that's what it was, recognizing that, you know, that, that, that linguistic connection may come from the Persian word wadrang. So there's, you know, what, what were they using in the desert? Or what fruit were they using when they first came to Israel? We have a tradition. We don't have the pictures. We don't have the images. But we certainly have tried to tie together the pre Hadar being an Esrog, uh, utilizing, you know, what we know about the Esrog and where it comes from. Certainly linguistically, you know, the, the China, India, Persia, Middle East, Israel uh, uh, path uh, does seem to fit. 
Um, but there's another tradition. Uh, again, uh, this is a Midrashic tradition. And this is how we now finally connect Christopher Columbus, should he have been Italian, into Esrog. Rabbi Moshe Sofer, uh, Hassam Sofer, is describing the idea that the, the, the Esrog, I always like to say that people ask me, when you have, what's a nice Esrog? You're looking for one that says Sunkiss, which of course is not good because Sunkiss is a lemon. A lemon and a citron are very different. But there is a concern that, the, as was mentioned in the previous source, that the, the, the Esrog is a very fragile fruit. And to strengthen it, sometimes it has been grafted with the lemon over the generations. But the rules of the Esrog is that it has to be built-in more conf. It can't be something that was grafted. It has to be something that's known to be 100% citron, 100% Esrog. And, um, you know, which exactly are, how do you know if it's uh, grafted or not? There are certain symbols and signs that are mentioned as possibilities. And the Hassam Sofer was addressing, how do you know for sure you're getting an Esrog that's 100% Esrog? So source number 10, he talks about uh, that the, the, these signs of what's uh, an Esrog are not biblical. They're not mentioned in the Talmud. Uh, and He says the Esrog is just like birds, uh, kosher birds, right? The kosher animals we know have symbols of whether they're a kosher animal or not. Split hooves, chew their cud. Fish have fins and scales. Kosher birds are not mentioned. Non-kosher birds are mentioned, and there's certain similarities, commonalities to them. Birds of prey, talons, certain weeks and the like, birds of prey. But kosher birds, we have a tradition. So whatever they were using as sacrifices must be kosher. Uh, you know, this included the, you know, the fowl, right? But it has to be a tradition. That's the whole turkey discussion. There was no, you know, what's the tradition that turkey is a kosher bird? And some in the Hassam Sofer tradition don't eat turkey. The rest of us usually eat turkey because they found the bird in North America. They brought it back to Europe. Some Jews were eating it, so therefore there's the tradition. But it has to be based on tradition. And he says the esrog is the same way. You know it. You know an esrog because of the tradition. He says al kain osan habayim mi yanova, those who come from Yanov, and Yanov is area Calabria in Italy. Shemisores biadenu meavos avoseinu verabosenu chachme hatzarfatim. If you have a Calabrian Esra, we have a tradition that our rabbis from Europe, from Germany, from France, from the old days uh, have been using these Esrogim, and therefore you can trust them 100%. And this tradition of these Yanova Italian Esrogim has a bit of a Midrashic mystical tradition. Uh, in the Hasidic communities, especially, and it mentioned uh, by an article on Chabad.org, summarized it, Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Ladi taught that when God told Moses that the Jews should take an Esrog on Sukkot, they were in the desert. Right? You'll never go hungry in the desert because of the sand which is there. Ha <laughs> ha. But there were no Esrogim. So Moses sent messengers via the clouds of glory to gather Calabria Esrogim. The tradition is that's where they found the Esrogim. Um... Okay, you know, some of you, you know, determine as you wish. People like to use Israeli esrogim to support Israel. Uh, some say the best is if you grow the Calabrian esrogim in Israel, you have the best of both worlds, and that's what some people do. But if, even if Christopher Columbus wasn't Jewish, if he was Italian, Italy and Sukkot are still intricately connected in the uh, search for the uh, kosher, uh, proper, beautiful, and possibly the original esrogim. So, uh, with this in mind, uh, we can celebrate uh, our tradition, the greats of our tradition, uh, recognize that uh, determining Jewish identity based on science is a complex uh, discussion. Uh, and when it comes to finding a beautiful esrog, I always like to say when it comes to the Lulu of an esrog, I like to paraphrase Harry Potter, Potter you know, the, the, where the wand chooses the wizard, right? The esrog, whichever esrog you get, that's going to be the most beautiful one to have. And hopefully it uh, harbors a beautiful holiday uh, for all of us. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Here in Israel, our kids, all oh, one, one family, just eats the turkey and won't eat the chickens because there was a chashash at some point. They were mixed with other birds. Uh, so they're actually eating, uh, you know, turkey. What there can I say? <laughs> and what, who's related to, to uh, Naama? What rabbi? You rabbi Dachowski is uh, in uh, Naama's mother's cousin's husband, something like that. You know, oh, really okay. completely... Distant relatives, but his name met. is Dikovsky. Shlomo Dikovsky. 
Como Zukowski, uh -huh, okay. And number three, I just gave your sources to David, and he says hi. He's in the back with Mark. <laughs> All right. Hello. So, Dara. Everybody. You too, on me.